now look at the cortical response to active range of motion and compare it to what we learned about passive range of motion response. We all know that active movement magnifies the cortical representations in the motor cortex. And a lack of use decreases these cortical representations. You must use it in order not to lose it. As we mentioned previously, active range of motion in patients who have joint stiffness established is unproductive unless joints are blocked to transfer power to the stiffer joints. So what happens in this maladaptive pattern is the patient repeats this maladaptive pattern, which magnifies the cortical representation of the wrong muscles. Moving in this pattern reinforces moving in this pattern. So our goal really with the stiff hand is not just to reduce the resistance to movement, it's to change the pattern. In 1966, Nudo studied squirrel monkeys, training them on a small retrieval task, picking up small objects with their fingers. The repeated activity of retrieval showed a significant expansion of the representation of their fingers within their primary motor cortex. One of many examples of proof of the expansion of motor cortex representation based on use. Here, if we look at pre-training, just of a portion of the finger extension, we can see that post-training, the area has significantly enlarged, proving absolutely that use determines cortical representation. Here, we see that the black represents finger extension, and the grayish areas is finger flexion. And if you compare the total left to right representations, you will see that training does create significant change. In a recent edition of the Scientific American, an article looked at the neuroscience of habits. And at the beginning of an activity, we use larger portions of our brain to decide and determine what needs to be done. You can see that the red represents high activity. And in this representation of a mouse going down this maze and either turning left to go to chocolate milk or right to go to sugar water, that as it approaches the decision points, the red becomes more prominent. But interestingly, after the mouse repeats this activity numerous times, goes from the expiration phase to the habit formation stage, there's actually very limited brain activity to complete an activity that's become a habit. So patients who develop the maladaptive pattern create the habit of movement, and they don't have to think about it. It's automatic. It is ingrained in their motor cortex. This happens very quickly, primarily because our brain is so adaptable and can change so readily based on input of movement. Here we see a schematic drawing of this process where the first step of new behavior is to establish a feedback loop in the prefrontal cortex. And then as we repeat the habit, the habit forms. And lastly, the habit is imprinted and we remember chunks or parts of the action so that this now becomes automatic for us. Constraint-induced therapy, which is a treatment approach primarily for patients who have suffered uh, some kind of cerebrovascular accident or trauma to the brain, is intended to overcome the learned non-use that occurs in response to areas of the brain not being functional within the motor cortex. It has been well proven that constraint-induced therapy creates a plastic reorganization of the motor cortex through use. If we take the monkey 
and we want to train the monkey and change the motor cortex representation, no change will occur unless the monkey is doing something new, something that requires a different motor pattern to which the monkey is already accustomed. So it is the newness of something that alters the representation. With constraint-induced therapy, in just two weeks of constraining the uninvolved side and demanding greater use of the involved arm, patients were able to demonstrate significant improvement in function, which they retained when they were tested two years later. Think of this, two weeks of input was retained two years later, and I would think more than likely it was retained because now the patient was able to increase the use of the arm, which sustained that improvement. Just within 72 hours, there was an improvement in the two-point discrimination and a redistribution of the hemispheric dominance. That, to me, is a rather significant statement, a redistribution of which brain hemisphere is more dominant. These rapid responses confirm that the hemispheric representations have great plasticity and can be changed with our input. Constraint-induced therapy uses a technique which is called shaping. And my suggestion is that we, as therapists who are treating the stiff hand, consider the elements of shaping which may be of use to our patients who have not had a CVA. You approach an activity, or if you would like to say a desired motor behavior, in small steps. You look at the components, you provide precise explicit feedback, you reinforce when the activity is done, and you choose tasks that are physically possible to successfully accomplish. An example may be you start out with a larger object, which would require gross grasp, and the size over time would decrease that requires a much greater fine motor involvement. There are four components to this uh, therapy. Intensive training on multiple days. In other words, really focusing on the, in other words, really focusing on activating the area of the brain that you need in order to accomplish the task. The use of small steps, small components, uh, maybe part of the activity, and then only as that successful do you add on the next step of the activity. And you use behavior techniques that are designed to transfer to the real world. Something that relates to the daily activity of the person and their hand use integrates this much more quickly and retains it because then it will be used. If you choose an activity, the example I would think of is taking a small dumbbell and, and doing wrist curls. That does not directly relate to any activity I can readily think of in the real world versus perhaps, let's say, wringing out a washcloth, which could use the same wrist extension finger flexion, but it is a functional activity that can be repeated and is neat to be repeated. Restraint of the other arm simply means that all the activity is focused in one motor cortex, which allows concentration to facilitate changes in that hemisphere. The good news is that when we're treating the stiff hand, we're not dealing with trauma to the brain. And there is previous cortical mapping for normal range of motion. So it's much easier for us, actually, than it is someone who's treating a CVA patient because we are able to reactivate previous cortical mapping. And that allows the process of changing 
motor plasticity to be accomplished much more easily. So my question to you is, if we can change the brain that's had direct trauma or injury, why should we not harness the uninjured brain of our patient with a stiff hand to be able to reduce the motor reorganization that occurs with maladaptive patterns? It seems to me this is far simpler with our patients than it is with those with a CVA. Now let's think for a moment about traditional treatment and how we would approach a stiff hand. We've talked a lot about passive range of motion and how it's a short-lived response in the stiff hand. Let's take another example of treatment of patients who've had a stroke. Nine patients underwent a week of usual physiotherapy and then one week of constraint therapy. And the researchers looked at the motor output of just the abductor pollicis brevis both before and after the constraint therapy. Before the treatment, as one would expect, the cortical representation was significantly smaller on the affected side. But after one week of conventional therapy, there was absolutely no change. But one week of constraint therapy, the motor output of this muscle had significantly enlarged and there was also a correlated improvement in dexterity. Proving specifically that the constraint-induced therapy was more effective. Flowers in 2002 commented that to restore normal length of tissue, we need to apply stimulus of activity. He, however, felt that it would be even better if we held the tissue lengthen for a significant time. Now, we know that stress alters collagen. It's well proven by being able to get in this posture. But we do not have any basic research supporting any particular treatment approach for joint stiffness. We tend to use the treatment approaches that are effective for the early stiff hand when treating chronic stiffness, even though we observe much less effectiveness in the chronically stiff hand. Let's take the example of a stiff PIP joint that lacks both flexion and extension. The patient extends the finger, but because of the increased resistance at the PIP joint, there's always hyperextension at the NP joint instead. In other words, the patient is unable to transfer the power needed to the stiffer joint. We know that if we pull on the extensor digitorum communis on a cadaver and we pull proximally, that there will be MP joint extension or hyperextension, but that there will be only slight PIP and very slight DIP extension. So we tend not to focus actively with the patient because of this maladaptive pattern. The same is true if there is stiffness in the interphalangeal joints or PIP joint. One will see hyperflexion of the MP joint because it has no resistance rather than interphalangeal joint flexion, which has increased resistance. So we approach these problems here for extension with different types of external devices. We're endeavoring to gain better active motion but our treatment approach uses passive devices that also superimpose immobilization. I am not saying that these are always inappropriate, but I do think that these treatment techniques are often most useful in the early stiff hand. There may indeed be an appropriate role for serial casting for interphalangeal joint contractures in the chronically stiff hand, but that would only be the beginning of treatment and never the full treatment in and of itself. These devices apply a passive force, they superimpose immobilization and may or may not provide constriction, which contributes to increased edema. Most of all, however, they allow absolutely no cortical involvement of a motor cortex. 
In other words, the way the patient moved never changes if this is the only input. Usually we approach therapy on really what is an unproven assumption. Many of us believe passive range of motion is necessary in order to gain active motion. We think passive must come first. Thank you.